Uh, welcome to today's uh, General Counsel Advantage webinar. Um, and the title of today's uh, uh, webinar is How to Motivate, Engage, and Develop Lawyers uh, and Staff in a Hybrid or Work, or re excuse me, Remote Work Environment. Um, my name is Bob Barker, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, as far as just a, a quick overview of, uh, of Barker Gilmore, for those of you maybe not familiar with the firm, uh, so we really focus on helping um, clients build, develop, as well as optimize their, their legal and compliance function. Uh, so that includes uh, recruiting general counsel, any lawyer that reports into the general counsel, as well as CCOs. And we also provide coaching and advising, um, mentoring to, to really help individuals and, and their organizations um, succeed. And just as far as the GC Advantage program, it, it's um, our complimentary professional development program, uh, provides an opportunity uh, for those of you around the globe that, uh, that participate uh, to hear directly from uh, both general counsel. Um, today we've got uh, CHRO um, as well as um, you know, board members and at times search consultants to just provide some insights uh, as you are developing your career as well as your organization. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and uh, everyone who is registered uh, will receive an email um, shortly after the, the information is posted to our website, which will probably be in the next day or two. We also have um, on-demand webinars, so recordings of previous webinars that you'll find on our website. And so the, the uh, upcoming webinar, uh, the, the next one, is going to be um, in December 13th, and it's Mastering the GC, CHRO, and CFO Triad for Organizational Excellence. And uh, that'll be led by Peter Gans, uh, who is a former general counsel at Ashland, um, and as well as the um, current CFO and former CHRO of, of Ashland. Um, as far as uh, questions, we encourage questions uh, throughout the, the event today. And um, down at the, uh, at the bottom of the Zoom application, you'll see a Q&A icon. Um, you can click that as well as then submit your questions. Uh, if you, um, there's, you, you'll be able to see all the questions that have been submitted uh, up until that point. And if there's a question that's that's already posted that you have, you know, similar, um, essentially a similar question, you can just click the thumbs up icon and that'll put it to the top of the list so that the speakers today uh, know that that, that is a, a popular topic. Um, with uh, no further ado here, um, I, I'm going to turn it over to Helen, and then I'll, I'll come back at uh, later in the in the session at the end. Thanks so much, so much, Bob. Um, could you remove the slides from the screen, and we'll get started so everybody could see us all in large form. Thanks so much. I'm senior advisor at Barker Gilmore, uh, where I advise general counsel and senior in-house lawyers in a variety of industries and in a broad range of areas. I also serve on not-for-profit not -for -profit and for-profit boards where I work with general counsel, including at Penn Mutual, where I have the privilege of working with Anne-Marie Mason, who's Penn Mutual's general counsel. Before joining Barker Gilmore, I was executive vice president and general counsel of the PNC Financial Services Corporation, one of the largest diversified financial services institutions in the United States. So I turn it over to Noah for an introduction and his background. Okay, first, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for joining. Uh, I am also a um, senior advisor to Barker Gilmore, and I also uh, am a mediator, arbitrator, dispute resolution consultant, and uh, uh, expert witness at times. Uh, my background is goes back primarily to being an in-house counsel. I worked at MasterCard uh, at uh, for uh, almost 27 years. I was general counsel for a little more than half of that. Um, and um, um, I, before that, I ran a nonprofit called the CPR Institute, 
which is a nonprofit that focuses on dispute resolution and driving best practices in arbitration and mediation. Thank you. And uh, let me, Helen, turn it back to you, and now we can uh, introduce our panelists. Thanks so much, Noah. Um, Kelly and Anne Marie, and uh, starting with Kelly, would you each describe your background, organization, and scope of your responsibilities, including whether your organization and legal department allow hybrid or remote work? Kelly, start with you, and then turn it over to Anne Marie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Toulier, and um, I am currently the Vice Chair, Chief People and Corporate Affairs Officer and Legal Secretary at Visa, a competitor to MasterCard. <laughs> Put that out there, Noah. <laughs> I like Noah, but, you know, we are competitors. Um, I know Noah for a long time. I met him right when I joined Visa to become the General Counsel when he was the outgoing general counsel, I believe at the time, Noah MasterCard, and then joined him at CPR as one of his directors on the board. Um, and Noah invited me to join you all today. So thank you, Noah. Um, I was the general counsel at Visa for uh, quite a long time, for over eight years. And I'm no longer in that role. Julie Rotenberg is our fabulous general counsel at Visa. Uh, she and I worked together since I joined I am now responsible for um, a couple of things in the company from the people team, obviously as a chief people officer, as well as the corporate affairs function along with corporate services. So corporate affairs includes uh, government engagement and communications and all things social and inclusive impact in our foundation um, and inclusion and diversity and corporate services is real estate and facilities and security and aviation and global events. I also oversee the company-wide transformation office, which uh, is focused on our company operating model. And in addition to that, I know that was enough, but I'm still the legal secretary to the board. Um, uh, I can't seem to give up that part of my legal job. Um, I don't really want to either. Our board is terrific. Um, and I think that that about covers all the things that I cover today. I I was a lawyer. I've been an in-house lawyer for a very long time, twenty-five years, um, in a couple of different companies. Lived overseas in Dubai. Was general counsel in my prior company for all of Asia, Middle East, Africa. Was a general counsel um, for a division in the U.S. Became the deputy at another company, and then joined over to Visa as the GC. And I think I'm one of those GCs who love the law, but um, has found other callings in my career. So it's a pleasure to join you today because I can also speak in those other roles in terms of being in charge of return to office and flexibility for the whole company in addition to the law department. So thank you for having me. Oh, that's great. And Kelly, I, I, Visa has, we'll get into this more, but uh, you have a hybrid environment. We have, a, we have a hybrid environment. Our policy is that our employees are required around the world to come in 50% plus, which means generally speaking, two days, one week, three days, the next, although we let our senior leaders decide on exactly which days. And my team is responsible for monitoring our success against our policy. And I'm happy to talk more about how it's looking, but it's going very well. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, when you sleep is the subject of another. <laughs> It's a good question. I don't think I can answer that one. <laughs> Amber, Amber, you can talk, give us your background, describe your scope of responsibilities and the organizational structure. Absolutely. Um, as Helen said, my name is Amory Mason. I serve as the chief legal officer for Penn Mutual. I also um, head up its privacy function, serving as its chief privacy officer, and I'm also corporate secretary to the board. Um, in, in my roles, I lead the entire legal function for Penn Mutual, its insurance affiliates, including its broker dealer and its asset management um, organization. Um, I lead up a team of lawyers, typical chief legal officer role, paralegals, other support staff in ex executing the legal function of the company. Um, with regard to the, the company's organizational structure, I would say that we have embraced uh, what we call a remote first or 
fully flexible approach to um, um, uh, our work style. Um, what that means in essence is if you choose to go into the office, there's office space for you. Um, but if you choose to work fully from home, that's also available. Um, I will say that all of my team right now is remote first, so they all work from home. I manage all of my staff remotely. Um, we currently have employees, including lawyers and other legal staff in about 42 states or so. 85% um, of our new hires have been in new markets since we've embraced remote work. And so we are pretty much for all intents and purposes, a fully remote company. Uh, okay, Noah, you wanna- Thank you. Thank you. So first question, uh, you know, when I think back to when I was general counsel, one of the issues, and I'm guessing it hasn't changed much, is whether lawyers should be treated differently, whether it was with respect to having an office, titles, compensation. Uh, I lost a lot of hair dealing with that issue with her senior <laughs> management issue. So my first question is, do you think the decision whether lawyers should be treated uh, when it comes to working uh, remotely or virtually or whatever differently than the rest of the organization or should they have to follow what the, the overall organization is? And I'll ask Anne-Marie to start. Thanks, Noah. I, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I do think it depends on the organization, its structure, work and environments, and what organizational goals and aims are at the point the decision is being made. I mean, I can certainly see an argument being made for if your team is already geographically dispersed, um, uh, you know, someone's in the Midwest, the South, then maybe you don't need to be where the, the, in, in the office if your clients are in the office. Um, that said, I think as a general rule, I think lawyers should be where their clients are. Um, I definitely think that there is um, a perception um, issues associated with lawyers being remote where the rest of the organization is not. Um, I could see some executives uh, believe in that, uh, you know, you, they're working, if they have to hike into the office, why can't the lawyers and looking at the team as though it's like a, an empty legal department over here. So my my general stance is like, there isn't any, a right or wrong answer. It does depend on your organizational structure, but as a general rule, I think lawyers should be where their clients are. Really? I think Anne-Marie is exactly right. Uh, 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 you know, um, again, for me, I think as a lawyer, the way I developed and became um, successful, became a general counsel, I think is because my what my clients would say about me is that I'm a business person who happens to be a lawyer. And to be effective at that, it's not just you know showing up on a, on a Zoom or a Teams call. I think it really is being shoulder to shoulder and grappling with the most difficult business issues as a partner, as an enabler. Um, we're not a support function in legal, uh, in legal, we drive this business. And so I think being very close to and connected to your business um, through in-person contact is very important um, for all aspects of legal. At the same time, you know, I think Anne-Marie's right, depends on your team and your company and your culture. I know that's what works, has worked my whole career. Um, that's what I believe success looks like and being together drives that uh, and I think Julie would say the same thing here. Same time, I do think lawyers are special. Don't tell all my other functions. I think lawyers are the most special. <laughs> and I, there's so many things that you talked about, no, including compensation. By the way, it's nice when a lawyer is the head of HR because you really do believe that the lawyers are special. <laughs> it's helpful to everybody. Um, but um, but I, you know, that whole being in the thick of it, being present. I think it is good for lawyers to really understand the nuts and bolts of the company. And I also believe that, you know, I, I and I know it's, it's a bias I have, but I love when lawyers have opportunity to go beyond law. And mm -hmm. to do that, you've got to be there. You've got to be with people in other functions to learn from them outside of a meeting. You know, it's a, it's a hallway conversation. It's a discussion about career. It's about getting mentors and sponsors outside of your direct silo that I think is very important for career development as, as lawyers progress to be in Amory's position as GC or move over to the business side or to other functions should they choose. I just, I think we all survived during COVID. We, we ran on our stored up, um, you know, good energy and connective tissue. Um, but I think the where, where we are now is there's a lot of benefit to being in the office some of the time. I can also tell you that I ran the remote work policy before I moved into HR for the company. 
and had a lot of resistance from senior leaders who said, you know what, remote means you get to work from home on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> That's what, you know, there's a lot of push for people to be in the office every single day. And I had to laugh that after we, we converted to, you know, all, working from home 100% of the time in the hybrid environment where some of those very senior leaders said to me, you know, you were right. We don't have to be in five days a week for people to collaborate, to innovate, to drive this business and to grow careers. There's a different way. And I think COVID, maybe that's one good thing that came out of COVID is, is we're all smarter about the fact that we can have more balance. We could not have the commute every day. We can be there to cook for our kids or meet them off the school bus and yet have very successful careers. Now, is, is the policy flexible if you have someone, I'll just say a star attorney, who either has childcare issues or family issues, yep. uh, whatever, will you make exceptions to the yes. two days a week policy? Yes. Um, so um, what we have is we have a category called remote, and that can be on a temporary basis or it can be a, term, a permanent basis. The reality is only about 5% of our workforce, though, is, is fully remote. At the same time, what I tell leaders, and this is why we empowered senior vice presidents in the company as opposed to me or anybody else, you know, it's like you go and drive the what you want your team to do. And if you have an employee who has a special need for a period of time or you know, a need to have an adjusted schedule, go handle it. You're a leader. I empower you. I support you. But at the same time, I am looking at data. I am seeing the company-wide data. I see through my reports, what we look like in terms of how many people are actually abiding by the policy company-wide. And so do my senior leaders. Every one of my, our senior leaders has a dashboard. It's live, it's data-based about which of their employees, there's a lot of information there, but it includes badge data. So who's coming in when they can monitor their team, they can see when somebody's not coming in at all that maybe they're not aware of, have that conversation. And it's not like, you know, we tell you, have that conversation and there's a result that you should drive to. It's either an accommodation because it's the right thing to do for medical or personal reasons, or um, it's a, hey, is there something wrong that you're not coming into the office? And so we had, a, you know, almost double digits. People weren't coming in at all over a three month period of time earlier this year. We all really focused on that population and had those conversations. That's number, that number's down now below 3% at this point in time. So, um, Emory, obviously, fully remote environment, very different setup. Uh, Kelly has talked a lot about the benefits of hybrid and uh, and being in person and together. Uh, Emory, what do you see as the major challenges of a fully remote environment, and how do you how so far how are you addressing those challenges? Yeah, no, I, it, it's it's challenging. Um, I do think that the benefits outweigh the challenge, but I do think there are a lot of things um, that makes it challenging. So one thing Kelly talked about, right? One of the biggest challenges is having your leaders be comfortable leading in a remote environment. And it's not the easiest thing, right? Um, so before it was super easy to say, Amory's a hard worker because she shows up every day. That is no longer a metrics that's usable, right? So how do you measure production and performance um, against? So, so leaders have to start leading differently. Um, we take away the, the energy spent around who was what and where, as opposed to are you producing your results, right? So you, we, we are training our leaders around setting clear goals clear expectations and measuring against that. Um, as, a, as a chief legal officer at GC, I make sure I reach out to the internal clients and I'll say, are you getting what you want when you need it? Can you reach Anne-Marie at the time Anne-Marie is supposed to be reached? Are you getting, what, what are you, your, is the production that's being delivered, is it meeting your expectations? So it's the biggest challenge I think is, is exactly something Kelly honed in on. It's like teaching our leaders how to lead in a remote environment. Um, and then from a people perspective, I think it's also hard to have that clear demarcation between work and home, right? Like you're home all the time. So I'm I, I, I'm just here and I, I work all the time. And so like managing that is also difficult. There is also, a, from an attorney perspective, how do you manage, um, privilege and confidential information when your kid 
your 15 year old is running back and forth and in and out of your office, right? How do you, you know, making sure that people have the right structures in place, cabinets that they can file, SEC filings that have to have a wet signature on. Those are real things that you sort of have to, very granular things, but very challenging things from a legal perspective when you're doing remote work. Um, and you just have to sort of be cognizant of them, be deliberate around, um, again, making sure leaders are setting expectations, goals, and checking for deliverables on time in order to manage some of that. But I, I will say that the, the, um, the biggest benefit that Penn Mutual has um, uh, gained from being a fully flexible environment is the ability to attract and retain amazing talent. Right. Like the idea that we are not restricted to a geographic era in terms of when I'm looking for a new attorney. Um, I think that that is just something that it's opened up our talent pool so wide. Um, and so we have a full on choice of like really good folks. Um, so I think that that benefit in and of itself vastly outweighs um, some of the challenges that we have to, to, to battle against. So, Emory, I just want to pick up on on one of the questions that is kind of relevant to your answer here, which was uh, from one of the people on uh, on the Zoom with us. Um, how could you be with the client? As Kelly talks about the importance of being with the client, if your client and the legal team were all fully remote. So, so the the, the way I look at it is, I am where my client is because everyone's remote. Right. So 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 that's that's my my if, if it would be one thing if the business folks are in the office and I'm working from home uh, all the time, again, barring certain cir uh, exceptional circumstances. So I am aware of my clients. So I think the most difficult thing from my perspective is when you have half of the team on a Zoom call and half of the team in the room. I think that for me is a pretty difficult thing to manage. And I especially think that when it comes to clients, if you are doing something different from what they're doing. That's what sets up that perception issue I talked about earlier. If we're all in the boat together, swimming on this, you know, everybody at, at Visa is 50 plus, right? It's not an, right, so or a vast majority of the folks are 50 plus. Everyone or a vast majority of the folks at Penn Mutual are fully remote or fully flexible. So I think there's alignment with the legal department and the business in that, in that context. Great, Noah? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with a question, the second question that was posed, um, and, and, it, and it's a good one. The, the, the question is where you have um, an intransigent CEO, happens to have been the former GC, who is uh, against providing the flexibility, and Marie that in particular, Penn Mutual has, and of course, the Visa has as well, just in a different uh, uh, form. How do you convince such uh, a... Uh, a, a CEO to be open to a more flexible remote environment. Emory, oh, go ahead, Emory. Um, you know, it's it's. I think you know, CEOs, but just a vast majority of them, um, they like data, right? They like they they like the idea of you know, like prove it to me. And so I think we can absolutely show like. During the pandemic, we were working and we produced and we were fine. You know, again, Kelly mentioned that earlier up top. So the idea that we're somehow going to become completely different because the pandemic is no longer upon us just doesn't doesn't flow logically, at least in my head. So I think you can use the data from what happened in COVID. And I understand the metrics are going to be a little bit different because during COVID, there was nowhere else to go. So you just worked. So I understand that the metrics will be a little bit different. But the larger point of people being able to be committed, sit on a screen, do their work, produce and deliver, and it, the, the company didn't fall apart, the company was super successful during that time period. I think that's a soup, that is a very compelling argument. Um, and that's where I would start. Yeah. I, I think that's a great advice. I think data is the thing that we all should be driven by today. Um, and, you know, when we were devising our, our policy, we were super thoughtful about it. And it was very data driven. So we, we did a bunch of round tables. We were watching our attrition data, which I track very carefully at the time. And we were doing exit surveys. Why were people leaving? Mm -hmm. And guess what was coming in the top three things at the time when people, when people were leaving, it was, you know what? I, I want a more flexible work arrangement as we were working through all of it. And, um, and people were leaving for more flexibility and some really high performance, like who's leaving, why? What type of performer are they? 
How do they fit in? And what are the, re and then like just, I had so much data, employee survey, roundtable data, exit survey data, attrition data, um, and then monitoring what going on with your competitors too, uh, in terms of where are they landing? So all that information fit into, and I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that our culture at Visa, when we decide this decisions like this one, um, it's not just the CEO, it's the senior leaders coming together and having an honest and open debate. Because this one, you know, it's a hard one and companies are all, are all over the place on it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a lot of people now going to four days per week. That's becoming quite common. You've got Amory's model where some are, are, are potentially fully remote. You've got people like us in the middle and we're sticking in the middle, but I'm continuing to look at it, right? And I also have a lot of data. We just came off our senior management meeting and I was talking about what's going on in the world and our workforce. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, over 60% of our population are millennials and Gen Zs. And guess what millennials and Gen Zs really, really want as compared to some of us old people. I'm just talking about myself, nobody else. It, you know, um, you know, we we grew up in a culture where you left your coat on the back of your chair when you went to dinner because you wanted to be a law firm life. You wanted people to think that you're always there. That's how we graded people. Um, this whole this generation thinks very, very differently. They want they want to be valued based on their input. And and they really they want to feel empowered and have that flexibility in their lives. And if you want the best of the future talent, not just today's, you've got to really tune into what they want and and make sure you meet them where they are. That doesn't mean giving into everything. We don't have like, you know, beer pong, you know, we don't have that kind of thing. But 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 we're really thoughtful and data driven and a lot of research about what matters. And then, and then, and now today with the policy that we have, you know, we are tracking in our, our attrition and, you know, our normal attrition before the pandemic, you know, it was, it, it varied depending on time of year when you paid bonuses and all those things, but you just call it around 8% in general. Our attrition right now is below 3% last mm -hmm. night. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of data that yeah. if, if, that you should be tracking. And if you, you don't feel like you have the workforce that you're, the policy that your for workforce wants, which sounds like Amory has the policy her workforce wants, um, and you're losing people at higher rates than others, then that's really good data. So um, that, that leads me to one question that, that in my view is probably the most important question. There's clearly big upsides to um, a virtual environment in terms of attracting employees. It's what I think most of them want, uh, that flexibility. But then there are those that believe that innovation and collaboration suffer. Um, so I'll ask you both, um, do you think innovation and collaboration suffer from a virtual or a remote um, or a hybrid environment? I, I, I don't think it suffers. I think it, it shows up differently. And I think leaders have to be more deliberate about it. But I don't think that it's, um, it, and it's, it's, it's a harder thing to accomplish, I would, fully see that argument, but I also think that it can be done if you're deliberate around it, right? So, so, and I think just by definition, the way lawyers work, it tends to be um, individual anyway, right? You're reading your contract, you're drafting a memo, you're doing, you're doing things that is not necessarily a group group dynamic. Um, but as leaders, I think it's incumbent upon us to force that collaboration, whether you're in the office or not. Um, so so like some of the things we do at, at Penn Mutual, uh, the law department is we have the weekly huddle and we have people talk about their cases. And so there you still can do that in a uh, virtual environment. But one of the key things I have found that really not fully compensate, if you will, for the we meet up in the hallway and we discuss something and that's how we spur innovation. One of the things that we've done is we schedule meetings and we make them 45 minutes long, right? And so that gives a 15 minute for you to just talk about what happened in the meeting. Just give you a chance to sort of, it, it doesn't fully re replace the hallway talk, but it does form as some form of replication of the hallway talk. And so you, 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 you're, you get your team together and you're still talking about it and you're still having conversations. Because I think I think that the thing that makes remote work work the best is communication, 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 right? Like everyone has to be on the same page because you can't rely on, oh, I'll see her in the elevator tomorrow. She always comes in at eight o'clock, right? So you have to sort of be a 
very, very deliberate about making sure that you're talking, you're talking, you're talking. So I do think, I, I, I think it, I don't think it suffers. I haven't seen it suffered at Penn Mutual. I mean, we're insurance company. So, uh, but, but at the same time, I think it shows up differently and you have to be more deliberate to make sure that it, it doesn't suffer. Kelly? I think Amory's right about that. Um, you know, we all read a lot of research about this topic and um, that, you know, we talk about community and collaboration here at Visa. And um, and I think that being in person can really help. But I don't think that, like Tamri's point, if I, if, you know, as a leader, we all did this during COVID. Like we, we proved that I have to be thoughtful about it and I have to bring people together and I need to give them space to be thinking and to share their point of view. I have to draw them out of that video, um, you know, and make sure that everybody feels comfortable and has a chance to share, particularly those who are, who are introverted. And, you know, we talk a lot about that. We've talked a lot about it recently here, which is our culture and really wanting to have a, a debate, a disagree and commit type of environment. And um, I, I don't know that you can't do that over video. I mean. I, the, the reality is because we all spread out during COVID, like we all have, I have people everywhere. I had a really important meeting about a very, str very strategic discuss, uh, topic today, one that I care about a lot. And I met with people on that, which was a real brainstorming session about being more innovative than any other company on a particular thing. Nobody was in the room with me, you know? Oh. And so I think I've learned how to do that both ways. Um, and so I, I, I don't, know that there's only one way to do it. I know that in a, in a very innovative um, space like payments where everything is changing right now in terms of how people like to pay and be paid and, um, and what networks can be used for to really drive the global economy and financial inclusion, et cetera. Um, I believe that having more time to intersect with those outside of those who you would normally intersect with because of what your job says it is, um, through you know joining sessions or popping in, I think can be very fruitful. But I don't think it is the only way. I think that would be closed-minded. I believe it works for our company that we are. The, the more together we are, the more we're going to pull out what people think and points of view, and we're going to learn more. You know, what I found in a, in a COVID world and, and and remote was I went to the meetings that were on my calendar. They're, we're very planful about those meetings. Um, here, when I'm here, I find, you know, and maybe it's my position, or the, but I can walk down the hallway and see anything interesting going on and pop on in and say, what are you guys doing in here? Um, and I, I want to hear about, I'm really interested in this. Um, I also find that as a global organization, when I travel around the world, when I go to India and I hear about new forms of, of payment or new ways of being paid, it sparks a lot of creativity in my brain when I experience the world in a way that just by attending a meeting or reading an article or watching a video, I just can't get the same excitement and the creative juices flowing. That's just me. But I really enjoy my global travels. Our business is very, very global. And I, I learn really well hands-on. And I think a lot of our colleagues do. And so this whole getting around and experiencing the world and bringing those experiences into how we innovate and serve our, our customers and consumers is a very important thing. Let, let, me, let me ask a, just a real quick follow-up question to that. Um, I do a lot of mediations and arbitrations. I do them both virtually and in person, and it works either way. What frankly, I don't find effective or as effective are hybrid mediations where some are present and some are not. Do you do you have that same experience in, in terms of decision making and um, and getting people together? Anne Marie, you want to go first on that? I know yeah, you guys are I happy. mean I, I I I can I can I can go first. Uh, that's I, I, that's the point I was making up top, which is sort of like I think the um the the 
trickiest piece of the puzzle is when some folks are in the office and some folks are remote and you're in a meeting together. Because there's just something that is um, that makes it a little bit more difficult for, and maybe it's because we are fully remote, where that and that's not something we experience quite frequently. But the other day we were going through performance reviews, year end performance reviews, and some folks were in the room and some folks were remote. And that was the most challenging time that we had at that point because the folks who were remote, the feedback we got, not remote, but via Zoom, um, were just, uh, it was hard to follow what was going on in the room. You know, things were said on the, you know, like laughter would erupt, but you didn't quite hear it because it was like a side comment or something like that, right? So it becomes a little bit more challenging in that environment. Um, and we haven't had to work through that too often because like I said, we're fully flexible and most people do do stay um, at home and work from home. But I, I do agree with that comment, Noah, that I think that that piece of it, when some folks are there and you're in one meeting, some folks are remote, some folks are in the office, that's a, a particularly challenging piece of this. So Kelly, I want, I want to pick up with you um, because I know uh, Visa has some very sophisticated tools and technologies yep. to enhance uh, communication in a ro remote and hybrid environment. Uh, to enhance knowledge sharing and workflow productivity. Could you talk about that? And part of that is somebody asked a very um, practical question is, what do you do when people are uh, on a video and they won't turn on their screens? So how do you in encourage also, et um, et et how do you encourage sharing and kind of uh, behavior ethical behavior when you in this environment a lot of a lot of subsumed questions in that but I know you've thought about this a lot yeah there's a lot in there um and um but I think at the core of all of that is developing your new norms and um your new uh, uh what is the right approach and what do we all value and respect in a hybrid environment um and so we do have very sophisticated tools. We're a Microsoft shop. Uh, we are uh, we are Teams, and you know Teams has really evolved during the pandemic to make sure that you have great capability. But before I get to that, I'll just stop back and say, okay, there's sometimes there's some talk about like an exec the executive committee. We what we do is we set aside because we're all like I'm in New York, you know San Francisco is the headquarters for Visa. Some of the leaders are here, some are there, some some are in DC. So, but what we say is there, there, we are going to come together at certain times and we will all commit to being together in the room. There are our calendars whole year in advance. Those are the times when we're going to be together. And those are the times we're going to make sure the topics that we discuss are those that we feel like warrant us to be in the room together, to really look each other in the eyes and do that disagree and commit type of behavior. So one, we think about that. Like we think about when we have those times together, what are the right topics that we get the most value from those personal interactions? And then we have dinner and we build up the social connections, all that stuff when we're together. But there are times when you're discussing things and, and they're important and, you're, and you are remote. So the tools really come in handy. So when you turn on Teams, I know a lot of people use Zoom. I, I prefer Teams, but I just don't know Zoom that's, that as well. Um, when we're on teams, there's a hand raising mechanism. And our cultural norm now is number one, we all, if you're in a, a conference room and there's and there's microphones and to make sure that those who are online can hear, we are we are all we're so religious. Like, don't talk, Bill, until you turn on your microphone. Like, don't do it. Like it's not allowed. Um, but we call each other out in a nice way. But we are all we are all cognizant of those people who are on the screen, and that you know what pre COVID, those people were, persons non grata, right? Remember that they'd be on the phone generally, and you you just like, but it's just your cultural norms have changed. You're really respectful of those who couldn't be in the room for whatever or not in the room. You're truly a global organization. You got a big Brazilian issue. The head of Brazil is probably going to be on that screen. So. How do you change your behaviors? We did we done a lot of training on that, but the the hand raising mechanism, just for example, has become really important to us. Like we we're really good. I there's twelve of us say in a meeting. That's too big, but just say it is. And there's an important topic, and you can't all jump on each other when you're on the screen, um, and and it's harder when you're not in the room. So we just we push that hand well butt in because it's my nature. But you we better people push that they raise their hand and we're all looking for it and if the leader of the discussion doesn't see the hand 
other people like Sue has her hand raised. Sue, you have the floor. And so again, when you go back before COVID, if you weren't in the room, you're on the phone, you weren't turning on your video. Um, you're like, well, it's a, I'm just not going to be able to participate in this case because of the nature of the thing. The thing has changed. And it's just, it's interesting to watch human behavior. It has to come from the top of the house though. But when it does, it really can work. And again, there are times when we're all together, but there are times when some people are in the room and some are not. There are times, particularly on Mondays, I don't know about the rest of you, but I guess today's Monday, but generally people are not going in on Mondays not, or, or certainly not Fridays. And and, all, and even those of the leadership team, it's Friday, you're going to see me at home in my office. And we have a topic, we, no matter, it could be board level, what, we're all going to be home. Um, and, you know, we've learned how to make that just as, as effective. The cultural norms, the behaviors have really changed. And I think that's what Anne Marie was saying too. It's like, what is expected? is what you figure out and how you lead is another great point that she made and how you drive trainings and how you set the tone from the very top of the house really matters when we're shifting so much these days, we could get into a whole nother topic, which how we're all going to be using co-pilot and, 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 and enjoy those shifts coming and how we're going to lead through that, which is another big topic, but we can do that one another day. You know, and I just, just to piggyback off of um, um, what Kelly is saying, um, someone because we're fully remote or remote first someone not turning on their camera to me is akin to someone not badging it right and what kelly said up top was absolutely correct right like why let's get to the root cause of that is it is it someone who needs support in a different way is it someone who's just sort of like disengaged like let, let's get to the bottom of it so because we're remote first, it's forced us to look at these issues and 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 marry it to where if we were in person, right? Like, what would the solution be? And so, if you're not turning on your camera, it could be the same reason why you're not showing up or not badging in. And the same um, advice Kelly gave up top would apply here, right? The idea is to unpack why that is and and figure out a solve for that. And Murray, you don't have people say I'm not dressed enough to be on camera. <laughs> I, I say that all the time, Noah, right? I mean, I was like, I didn't brush my hair this morning. No, I mean, people, and, and it's, and, and that's true. And Zoom fatigue is, ab Zoom fatigue is absolutely re real. I have a policy for the lawyers that we can do no camera Fridays because by the time it gets to Fridays, it's just, you're tired of staring at yourself on the screen. And, you know, if we're meeting with a client, if the client's okay with that, we, we all go, we all go cameraless, but but generally speaking, if we're just talking to each other or ruminating about a case or how we're going to handle something, it's no camera. Um, and I think that's that's helpful. Anne and Marie, um, just again, because you have sort of a unique, fully remote environment. Um, one of the questions uh, that was asked are for examples of specific team building activities that you have used successfully. And then we'll ask Kelly, even in a hybrid environment, uh, anything in it that she suggests as well. So we we have a couple that we've used to great success. The, the weekly huddles. It's just we get together on a Wednesday, so middle of the week, and we talk about anything and everything. Who has a new puppy? To uh, the new class action filed against a competitor. Right. It's it's everything. So like people are just talking. We're just. There's no stress around what the topic should be. Um, and we, 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 that's worked to great success. We also have twice a year in-person get together. So uh, one for the summer, because we have summer interns in the law department. So we have an event around that. And then we have one in the winter, like to, at the end of like the holiday season. So there in we have, you know, whether it's an outside law firm, we'll come in and do a CLE, but we do have intentional in-person events because as much as remote is working, you have to also recognize that people want that in-person connection. So it's not, you know, so you, you, so, so most of the events we do that are deliberate to, to counteract the, I don't really know Anne Marie. I've not spent a lot of time with her. We haven't gone and grabbed a beer or whatever. I don't drink beer, but whatever, right? So like you, 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 you create um, opportunities for folks to get together. The other thing that I have done um, with some of the legal team is if my clients are having their in-person 
meeting, like let's say it's an annual distribution meeting or something like that, I raise my hand and say, oh, can I send a lawyer there too? So they, because they support that, right? So when 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 the internal clients are having their in, internal uh, events in person, I make sure a lawyer attends if they to the extent they can. Great. Kelly, do you have any kind of specific examples that you have found particularly successful? Yeah, but I'm still I'm 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 still stuck on Amory's talking about her when she they get together. How many times do you say to people, Amory, wow, you're taller than I thought? Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> or you're shorter than I thought you would. <laughs> wow, you're so short. That's not very nice. But I tend to say that to people, but I don't do that. I, I remember when we came back from COVID, that was like my wow, you have that big personality and you're like five foot two. How do you do that? Um, uh, but, but today for us, you know, the way we built it and, and trust me, we built it. This was change management. We went to a new policy. We're going to be in, you know, 50% plus. We really were very thoughtful and we put out a lot of materials and Visa University, we actually did a lot of training. And so, you know, the, what's working is that when you want to do team building, um, and this is why we empowered senior leaders and leaders to decide what are the days when their team comes in. To be honest with you, I monitor that too. It looks like Tuesday and Wednesday are very popular days for people to come in. Um, there's some, there's a, there's a Thursday crowd and to some extent the Monday crowd, but it's like, I'm like the whole world. I said, you can do whatever you want. I know there's only five days. All of you think Tuesday and Wednesday are the right days, but they kind of did. Uh, but the idea is that if you're going to do team building and collaboration and maybe brainstorming and whiteboarding, you really, you're really, really good as a leader about saying, we're going to do those on our days in the office. We call them collaboration days. And so you're going to go out and just have that beer that Amory talked about. You're going to do that on your collaboration days. And so when we, we really, I don't hope it doesn't sound like we micromanage the heck out of people, but I think we just said, Hey, we want this to be very successful. So if you want to do team building or you want to do brainstorming, we ask that you really try hard so that when people are in the office, they feel like there's a reason they came in, not just to sit at their desk and do email and, and draft a contract. Mm -hmm. They came in, they're, they're doing that too. Trust me, some roles that's, you know, you got to do that. You can't, you're not going to be in meetings and, you know, happy hours all for a while. We did happy hours. It felt like all day long, but that was early days, <laughs> but it's like, but, but give people a reason. Cause you don't want to resent them. And you say, and this was hard, the transition from five days at home to saying, please come in. Two plus, it took a while. Trust me, our numbers were not what they are now. There was, there was some resentment from people who did not want to make that transition. Why do I come? I can do more by skipping the commute. I can be more productive. Why am I coming in? So we were super clear about come in and we as leaders will ensure that you'll feel the benefit of coming in, which is not just sitting at your desk for eight hours. It will be a combination of things that you'll come away feeling, okay, I get it. And where we are today, I haven't done an employee survey yet. I'm building up to one in February from the one that I did last year. We did last year in February, right after we launched the policy in January. And I only had around 50% of the people at the time who were happy with what we did. Here we are a whole year later. I think we're going to get a very different result. And I think the numbers show it. But I think we did a lot of thinking and a lot of direction about how to best make this successful. So... Um... I actually just read an article this morning, a McKinsey article on reimagining the virtual workplace. And it was interesting. It said that the virtual workplace can either drive inclusion and engagement or undermine it, depending on how it's addressed by each organization. One of the examples they point to is eliminating the head of the table because everyone is a square, an equal square. Uh, and also that leaders can monitor who's not sharing their point of view and can ping them and and really kind of give people opportunities that they may not naturally be able to do. So I think uh, my question to both of you is how has the hybrid environment or remote environment affected diversity and inclusion, including diversity hiring? Has it been a positive or a negative or a neutral? Anne Marie? Uh, it's been a game changer for us. Um, frankly, I mean, I, you know, or you talk to the person who sits in Kelly's seat at Penn Mutual, um, or CHRO, she, she has all the stats and it's been, I mean, I, I think that 
and, and it's not just diversity from an ethnic or um, racial perspective It's it, or, or gender, it's geographic diversity, right? Like talking to someone on my team about going to the Iowa State Fair, like things that we would just never have experience with on a day-to-day -day basis um, based out of Philadelphia. So I, I think that it's been, again, because we are able to attract folks and folks don't have to contemplate the idea of moving their children, changing schools, figuring out a new doctor, their pediatricians will change. It's just opened up a, a, just a huge avenue for us um, in, in that regard. And I, I think we're able to attract uh, and retain, right? Like, like some folks are just willing to stay. And um, Kelly talked about attrition um, earlier and it's been the same for us. Like, I think we are at like a 3%, 2% attrition. It's just really low because people love the environment and they love the culture and they love the fact that they are not faced with false choices. Like I could either, you know, get my kid off the school bus or I can be a successful lawyer. Those are false choices in 2023, my my humble opinion. Um, there are opportunities to do both. And I think that that, that is um, why remote first or fully flexible has, has worked so well for us. Do you, do you get junior folks saying they're not getting FaceTime with senior executives uh, because of the remote environment? I don't hear that from my lawyers. Um, I, I do hear... Um, the, you know, we, we call this, we call it Zoom bombing at Penn Mutual. And I encourage folks to do that. Like if, you know, you look on the screen and someone's green means that they're not in a meeting, Re use that to replicate, like just walk into someone's office. Um, I, I, you know, we are a pretty flat organization. Um, we don't have a lot of layers. So I think that exposure to leaders come early and quickly for a lot of junior folks. So I don't, I don't hear that at Penn Mutual, but again, because everyone is in the same boat, we're all rowing together in the same direction, um, it doesn't feel different for, for anyone in particular. I don't know if Kelly's experience is any different. Yeah, it's very similar. And I think in terms of diversity, go back to your original question, Noah, you know, I think there's a variety of factors, though, that contributed to so many of us um, really became more diverse workforces um, over the past several years. And our numbers reflect that, whether it comes to um, underrepresented or female in the United States. Um, and, um, I think there were a lot of things that went into it, but part of it was during COVID, we loosened up our, where you have to work approach. It's something I'm a little bit worried about right now because we have offices, you know, we have offices, New York, DC, Miami, Ashburn, Virginia. Uh, I've got Baltimore. I've got, um, Denver. I've got Austin. Uh, you know, I, I got a lot of offices in the U S and before this happened, it would be, well, but you, the job is here. So you must move to San Francisco or the job is in New York. You must move. We all became very lax about that. Like it, we're going to be on cameras anyway. We like you attach yourself to an office so it's easy to get in. But we we drove a lot more flexibility on location, which opened up the workforce exactly as Amory is talking about. Um, and I, th I think, you know, our numbers, and I just talked about this, I did a three-year read. Um, uh, we added a whole lot of amazing women and, you know, and we added a whole lot of uh, very strong people of color and of other backgrounds to the company. So quite proud of that. Now we had, now we were also growing like crazy. Like I've added a huge percentage of my workforce over the past couple of years. And, um, and and now here we are in this hybrid world and uh, we're not hiring like we were. We were hiring like crazy. We all the most companies that we all were this big war for talent, um, you know, all the um, the quiet quitting has has all come down as the economies become less certain. And and so now you have to continually think about who you are, what you're doing and how do you retain all those great people and what do they really want? Um, it sounds like if they went to work with Amorites, because they really love this whole world of being remote. I didn't attract people, particularly over the past year or so, based on that promise. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on flexibility, though. Um, and so now, though, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, I think it is super important to say we did. We all did a good job, I think, and we became more flexible and and on how people work, where people work. That's all good. That, that attracted more people into the workforce. How do we make sure we keep them?
Mm -hmm. oh, Kelly, I just wanted to pick up on because because you you do have a hybrid environment. So one of the questions is um, how do you mitigate against proximity bias for promotion and mm -hmm. uh, in a hybrid environment? Yeah, I think, uh, and we all know proximity bias is real, right? And I'm self-aware enough to know that, that I have it too. And um, if I'm in a meeting with you often and I see you rocking it, you know, I, I, and I'm, I'm going to lean into that promotion when, you know, your neighbor could be just as strong. I just don't happen to see it as much and I'm a decision maker. So it's a very real thing. But again, I think to in, in our hybrid model, by driving to make sure that leaders are in the office, the days that all of their team is in the office, similar to Amory's, leaders are home every day their team is home, um, then that enables you to try and really spread your focus around and be with, with your teams more. But proximity bias is there, whether I think whether you're hybrid or not, it's something along with all our inherent biases we have to really, really fight. Um, but I don't know how much different it is so long as you're setting up your meetings to have exposure to your whole team and drawing them out and not just gravitating to those who are most like you. And uh, uh, thank you, that, that's very helpful. And then turning to you, Anne-Marie, uh, an, another question is uh, in your fully remote environment, how do you help develop and strengthen the technical skills of the lawyers? Uh, any specific suggestions on how you help them grow and stretch? So, so my, my groups, are, it's most of them are relatively new to the organization. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we talk about this as in-house lawyers, like the first thing you have to do is um, know your client's business, right? Like you've got to learn the business to be able to talk to them intelligently about the legal um, aspects of it. So we we are very deliberate and like law firms love to do this because they get some FaceTimes like, you know, the the, the free CLEs that like coming in and talking to, um, to, to folks around whatever the hot legal topic is. Um, I, I haven't had to struggle with teaching them technology because our, our, the technology we have is no different from what they have experienced at law firms. I've got a couple of former prosecutors on the team too. So it, it, there, it's it's not, it's not, we don't have technology that necessarily um, mandates teaching or having training classes around that. But I do know that from a professional development perspective, um, we do, like I, if I, if I get a webinar that I think person A and B would be really, really good for them to attend. I, I send it to them and I said, let me know if there's anything I do to clear your calendars if you can't make it, right? It's like a, a, a subtle message to make sure that, you, go listen to this because I think this is good for you developmentally. Um, so, but I we don't have the, a specific technology, you know, issue, but, but teaching um, folks about financial services, the insurance uh, world in particular is something that I'm very keen on and we, get law firms to come in every day and tell us about a particular topic area, or I send them stuff or webinars that um, they can attend. Uh, let me just look yeah. at the chat again. Um, so, and I wanna save- I actually uh, think um, um, there's about three or four questions and I think we only have like two minutes. So <laughs> I think one, one, of the, one of the questions was, from someone who whose shoes I've been in, which is, you know, in this environment, I guess whether you're remote or virtual, we all recognize the value of offsite get, get you know get-togethers. And how do you convince management, with especially with budget challenges, to go ahead and authorize that? Um, for for I could take that. My my answer is really short. That's the we just did. It came out of a successive engagement surveys, and that was the one thing that showed up. So we we have like a. 90%, you know, out of 80, 80% respondent, 90% like ranked the company as like a great place to work, right? Like great numbers. But the one thing that consistently showed up was we need more in-person interaction. So it, it became super easy to convince my CEO that maybe we should look into this because 80% of the company thinks we should, we should do more of this. So um, again, data. It's a compelling argument. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think offsites are, are such an interesting thing. I grew up in a world where we always had, you know, we went somewhere. I, one of my jobs, I went to Bali. We went, we went to offsites, right? And um, 
that's it's just it's not post COVID. It's not the thing anymore where you spend a lot of money of your budget and you go off site and do. And so I think we all have to get creative about that and and think about being you know what run your business or your what you do as a, as a CEO and that's your budget and is that the best use of your time? It's no longer the norm, but I think it helps you to be creative and say, oh, let's stay local and let's go have a dinner and do other things. But it's it's not the norm anymore to go off and have expensive offsites. So we have a lot of um, very specific questions about uh, how do you, uh, we have a few, how do you treat um, compensation in geographically diverse workplace, their difference in compensation between those who work remotely and those who are hybrid. And then there are questions about tax information handling and which we, you know, that is beyond uh, this webinar, unfortunately. But um, let me just ask uh, one quick uh, question, uh, yes or no answer for Kelly, uh, for Kelly and Anne Marie. Uh, or do you treat compensation differently, Kelly, mm -hmm. for those who work uh, on a hybrid basis and those who work remotely? And you no, know, our, our compensation is geographically based, and we don't make a we don't make a call between hybrid and remote. Um, sorry, you asked me yes or no. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really expect you to stick with the yes or no. <laughs> sorry, go ahead, Emery. <laughs> we, we 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 do not treat it differently. Uh, we don't. Uh, let's ask a sort of a wrap-up question and uh, the future, the crystal ball future. And Kelly, where do you see um, the future defined in any amount of years or weeks or months as you define it in terms of remote and hybrid working? And I'll ask Anne-Marie Mason and also ask if you have developed avatars for a future. Anyway. Yeah, that's an AI question. I think, you know, I think we, I think we went from, we went from all, you know, success was five days a week in the office and maybe four in some places, but generally five days to 100% at home to now the pendulum has swung back and you even see, you know, tech companies who we all, you know, four days in the office. So it's, it's kind of swung. And so I have a team that's really focused on creating strategies of the future for this. But I, I do think that for us, for a space like mine, Hybrid is here to stay. I don't think I'll ever, and I don't think I want to work in a place, guys, to be honest with you, where I'm going to be in the office Monday through Friday. I really like the flexibility. I think, I think it makes me a better leader and a better mom and a better, and all. so I think some version of hybrid is here to stay. I, I fully concur with that. I, I don't think the pendulum will ever go back to five days, not ever, but it would be a folly if it went back to five days a week because I, I think folks, you know, did a lot of sacrifice in terms of um, during the pandemic and showing that they could actually deliver when they had to. And so I, I from a management perspective, I think it would be um, a, a vote of no confidence to your team if you say like, but still, you have to be back um, five days a week. So I think some iteration of hybrid, remote, fully flexible is here to stay. Well, yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here. Um is we're, we're just a few minutes past two. So um, I just want to say thank you to, to Helen and Noah for, for hosting today uh, and Kelly and Anne-Marie for, for sharing your insights and um, experience to community around the world here today. Um, yeah, we want to make this program just as valuable as possible. So we look forward to um, receiving feedback. Uh, we are going to be sending a a one minute survey out to everyone. So if you please take a minute to, to provide that feedback, we greatly appreciate. Um, and obviously please contact us if, if we can provide any recruiting or coaching uh, services uh, to you or to your organization. Um, again, we look forward to having you join us in the future GC Advantage program. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Have a Thanks everyone.